Okay, um, let's let's do it then. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Pod Chat Live, episode number ninety nine. Uh, recording this 24th of February 2022 and um, we're looking forward to this one because it's a part two it's uh, we're talking about sort of vascular podiatry as we've named this and part one of this was all the way back in uh, 85 episodes ago episode number 14 uh, first week of March 2018 and that was entitled, if memory serves, the vascular assessment of the lower limb. And we've got our vascular dream team, although only one of them's here at the moment because Peter is, uh, she's running a bit late. Oh, oh look at that. That is absolutely perfect timing. Um, hi, Peter. Um, so yeah, we've got our vascular dream team back. Uh, they were kind enough to give us more of their more of their time and their knowledge and their enthusiasm. Um, so we're, we're, we're delighted that they can join us again some, some four years later. Um, and I do encourage people to go back and watch or listen to episode 14. Um, we're going to be making probably reference to it today. I, I, I'll admit now I broke my own golden rule. Normally when we've recorded these, after we've recorded them, I never watch them and I never listen to them ever again. That's just, I don't like seeing myself. I don't like hearing myself. It's just a weird thing. But I broke that rule today on my run at lunchtime today. I listened to episode 14 of the podcast just to remind myself what we talked about and, and actually reminded myself how much great stuff was in it and all the stuff that it taught me. And I, I'm certain tonight is not going to be any different. So Martin, Peter, thank you so much for joining us again, four years on. You're welcome. welcome. Well, let's, um, obviously, if you're watching live, please do feel free to jump into the comments. Um, it is an episode that I think, um, you know, last time, it was much better to watch than it was to listen to because of the visual stuff. Martin and Peter did some cool stuff with Dopplers, and you know, there may be some more some more visual stuff coming. So, uh, if you are listening to this after the fact in your ears, you know, on a podcast version, it might be worth getting onto YouTube and watching uh, watching the video. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry, and before we start, we're we're getting massively spammed in the comments. People linking to external oh. links to try and hij <laughs> hijack us. I'm blocking lead, read, I'm blocking people left, right, and freaking centre, and <laughs> um, and they're, they're actually posting quicker than I can delete them. But I'm, so just <laughs> anyone listening, do not follow these links. They're trying to hijack you to an external site. Um, this is how uh, this is how big time we've become since episode fourteen. Guys. We get spammed now, so uh, it's uh, it's never happened before. So I suspect it's probably that we have such such significant interest that they're trying to divert the, the audience elsewhere. Actually, at the start of episode 14, I, I actually said, um, just that it was the most popular uh, episode to that date, and the pre-interest was huge. And, and, and that completely applies to this episode um, number 99. Uh, over 1,400 people at least registered interest or set a reminder. So I'm not saying they're all gonna be on here with us, but I suspect the spammers have seen that and they're trying to to leverage that um we appear to have lost peter is that is that the spammer's got her crate what's going on no she's back now i'm just uh, <laughs> there we go so, well, then, not sure what happened I got let's out. uh let's crack on let's 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 uh oh look there's another one there's more spam coming up um yeah, sorry, craig, craig looks stressed so i'll leave him to that and we'll get cracking because we've, we've we've got so much to talk about in 45 minutes and we don't i can't say that um, although we'd love a part three, I'm not sure I could convince you both to come back for a part three. So let's try and get 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 cracking. Um, four years have passed since we last uh, chatted, and obviously a lot happens in four years. The world um, is a very very different place now uh, compared to what it was four years ago. But that that kind of slightly depressing stuff aside, what does the world of uh, vascular podiatry look like four years on? What what developments, what what um, advances, uh, you know, what changes has, has the world of vascular podiatry seen that perhaps you'd like to, to highlight for us? Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in there, Peter. I mean, first of all, we had Peter come over to the UK, uh, I think three years ago now, and present at our conference, uh, the, the Royal College Conference, which was fantastic. And um, we, we've, we've formed loads of collaborations, really, I think, since we last spoke, and the strengthened existing ones in certainly in the UK. I know Peter's been linking up with Joe Mills and others in, in the USA and, and uh, that part of the world. And we've been locally in the UK linking with our vascular surgeons much more, uh, the Vascular Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, we're building relationships with the Society of Vascular Nurses. 
with the um, British Lymphology Society. So there are various things that are strengthening around the theme of uh, lower limb vascular disease and vascular skilled podiatrists playing a, a lead role, I suppose, really, from my perspective. Um, and in the college, uh, Royal College, we've also set up recently a vascular special advisory group. So it's interested podiatrists from around the UK and Ireland who are now collectively getting together to let me retire um, and, uh, and and take the lead on this sort of thing as we, as we move forward in the four nations here or the five nations, including the south of Ireland. Lovely. I, I, I recall from, uh, you know, episode 14, a couple of things you said. The first was that not many not many podiatrists were, were doing it uh, at the time. And the second was obviously that historically there was some friction between uh, the vascular surgery team and the podiatry team. But, but of course, that was changing with a with a new a new sort of um, wave of younger, different thinking kind of consultants. So it sounds like four years on, the trajectory is, in all regards, very much uh, heading in the right direction. What what does the next four years, five years look like? Is it just continuing on this on this upward slump? Peter, what do you think? I hope so. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, and especially in community and private practice settings. I think there's much more of an awareness now of the importance of these basic skills in vascular assessment. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done um, on interpreting and actioning these results and using clinical reasoning skills to make really good action plans and management plans and helping these people. So I think that's the next step. I think. I feel, I don't know about you, Martin, but I feel like we've convinced people to do the testing. Now it's what's next, what comes next. So yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, we, we know we've done those two fairly big sample surveys in, in Australia, New Zealand, and in, in the UK. And I think we did the UK one since we last spoke to you. And we found out that, you know, we've got a problem in dietary. If I can bring up that slide set, Craig, that first one, I just sort of highlight the figures. Okay. Um, um, so I'll just sort of skip through that a minute. Um, so we, you want this is the sort of summary of the results from the survey that Peter's team led, uh, both in, in, in uh, Australia, New Zealand and the UK, um, two or three years apart. But basically we found that less than 50% of podiatrists in, in both continents are uh, regularly using ABPI or toe pressures. And we look at toe pressures, the Australians are ahead of us on that front. Um, in the UK at that point, it was only 6% of podiatrists who responded to survey. So we've got a lot of work to do, but like Peter said, I think the case for why we do it now and how we start to interpret and utilize those results to diagnose arterial disease or exclude it crucially, so we can perform a lot of podiatry interventions knowing we're safe to do so, or we find the disease and then uh, work with our primary care colleagues and our vascular hospital colleagues to get it managed depending on severity. That's the game of the next five years, is really firming up how we how we make that a normal part of podiatry, um, both in private practice in the UK with our independent practitioners and within the NHS. Um, yes, we're getting a lot of interest. We're putting on a lot of one day, two day courses and they're filling every time. Um, and we always get asked at conference to do workshops, but we've got to build confidence and capabilities still across the board within podiatry. And that's going to take a generation, I think, really, of, of lecturers as well to get involved and managers as well as the clinicians that are interested. Yeah, L looking at this slide here. Oh, sorry, Craig. Can you just, um, yeah, perfect. Um, something jumps out that, that obviously, you know, pul you look at the sort of uh, the palpation of pulses. Um, it, it's amazing when I look at the, the Australia, New Zealand versus UK numbers that almost 100% in Australia and New Zealand and 50% in the UK. Yeah, I think that was a strange result, unexpected in the, in the survey. And I wonder if it's about how people ask, answer the questions because um, nearly every podiatrist I speak to in the UK, um, when we ask them to stand up and put their hands up, what they do do, they'll say we palpate pulses and we write that down. Mm. Uh, records. So I think their interpretation of the questioning was a bit... Um, unusual in that particular response. Yeah. Whereas the Doppler responses look fairly similar. And the ABPIs, you know, we've got it all matched there. So I don't know what you think, Peter, but it was just a bit of an odd, odd, odd report back on that one. I don't think the Brits don't like pulse, uh, pulse palpation, put it that way. 
Yeah, I agree. I think it's something to do with the way we asked. I know we definitely asked differently with the UK survey just because of over-reporting, I felt, in the first one, in the Australian one. So, yeah, I wouldn't read too much into that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you look at the reasons for the old barriers at the bottom here, lack of time and equipment and experience, that you could argue that may apply to, you know, toe, toe pressures, but none of those things feel like they apply to to palpating pedal pulses. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. So how do we, you know, I wanted to talk about toe pressures because I know we talked about them four years ago. Um, uh, what's the uptake essentially? Well, I can, we can see the kind of numbers here. What, 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 this is where we are now, but how important is this? And is this people just working in vascular or are people doing it pre-nail surgery? Should, should they be? Like, how do we get these numbers up? Peter, go on. <laughs> How do we get them up? Um, overcoming these barriers, I think. So I do get a lot of emails from practitioners in the UK who are trying to build cases within their trust to get funding to buy toe pressure equipment. So I think there are some fairly like systemic barriers um, in the UK, but Martin could probably speak more to that. Um, in terms of experience, I guess, yeah, like Martin said, building it into the undergraduate curriculum. So these are basic competencies that we teach from year one. Um, but I'm not sure what the lay of the land is like over there. But and it's maintaining those skills. So I think sometimes, you know, podiatrists will enter a practice that doesn't have the equipment and then they lose they big skill rapidly and lose confidence. So um, I think all of these barriers sort of go hand in hand and we need to overcome all of them in order to make sure that those skills are maintained from yeah. entry level practitioners all the way through. Yeah, sure. Just on that, Peter, we just had a comment um, from James. Didn't you two just show that people how to do toe pressures in under a minute? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what it's so the, uh... I think that's what gets my goat the most is that people go, oh, I haven't got time. And I just think that's the, a perception. And that's Martin's been working really hard to, you know, break down that perception because it really does not take much time at all. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a bit of, we put it on at the conference uh, a couple of years ago where we did the two minute toe pressure challenge. Um, and it was a game changer in that it did spark quite a bit of interest around the UK and a little bit of competition online. People were sending videos of, of the, the, the teams doing it. Um, and it was that idea that we break down the idea that a vascular assessment takes half an hour or 45 minutes. You know, my, my I, I do them every day. So, of course, I'm, I'm quick at it. But my, my full um, NICE guideline, international guideline um, recommended uh, foot to femoral pulse checks, quick check of the aorta to check there's no um, large aneurysm there, and then ABPI and toe pressure. It takes me less than 20 minutes to do that in total. But crucially, when you're looking at busy podiatrists working in general practice or wound clinics, um, the idea of the two-minute toe pressure with Doppler, so you've got Doppler and toe pressure results together to make a reasonable clinical decision, I think is the way forward. And we also teach the same principle with the you know, the two minute ankle pressure, it takes a little bit longer with ankle pressure, but same principle that if you've got a limb of concern that you're want, you want to work on with a foot problem or whatever, um, that you don't need to do the full ABPI or TBPI, you can do the initial two minute assessment where you include the three P's principle. You palpate, you take a phase of the, of the, of the waveform, um, and then you take a pressure, either ankle or toe. And it can be a really quick, um, uh, mini vascular assessment that can give you the information to deal with what you've got in front of you on the day clinically. You may then want to, depending on results, go to a full vascular assessment later on if it's non-urgent, or it might be that you're having to decide today, try and admit someone to a vascular um, hub 15 miles away or 100 miles away, and therefore it's really important you get the, the limb assessment correct, as, long as, the as well as the clinical picture. So it's changing those perceptions, like Peter said, about how much it takes time-wise. And also the cost has come down tremendously with mobile vascular diagnostic kits. So you can you can get the full uh, digital Doppler and uh, toe pressure ABPI kit for less than uh, 2,000 UK pounds now, um, which may sound a lot of initial investment, but when you're looking at uh, the average amputation costing anywhere between, you know, 15 and 40,000 um, pounds, saving one of them with one um, early uh, assessment and then limb salvage um, intervention 
is is really how we need to think about how we we're investing now i think sure just um peter just a comment you you made a comment uh, you're getting all these emails about people wanting to know how to make their case to their trust in the uk um abby's just commented just um what's your answer to those emails what, what are you saying to them what, what how do they make the case <laughs> Well, after I sort of reply with WTF, um, <laughs> I argue with evidence. So, um, yeah, often I'll send them citations. So uh, the systematic review on um, TBI that I've authored um, and a few other key papers in the field. Um, so argue with evidence would be my um, and cite the guidelines. So, Martin, you probably are more well versed with the NHS guidelines or the NICE guidelines. Sorry. Yeah, um, you, can, you can bring up that slide again, Craig. Just um, the one that just sort of ties into this bit of the discussion, really. So, the same slide set. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Just yeah. Thanks. Oh. I can see it now. Yeah. So, the, these are the three sort of um, key guidelines for any podiatrist. I think in the UK at least, and uh, two of them are international. So the NICE guidelines for peripheral arterial disease have been out since 2012. And if you're not operating to them now and you miss peripheral arterial disease and then you get into a blame game with a poor um, outcome like an amputation or a non-healing post-surgical podiatry wound, then you're really going to be on a sticky wicket if you've not done the basic diagnostics first. And the International Diabetic Foot Guidelines and the Global Vascular Guidelines, both sort of republished in 2019. And the consensus in both of those is that we need to be doing ABPI and toe pressure as part of our um, minimum uh, lower limb vascular assessment to exclude or confirm PAD. So we can't rely on pulse palpation and Doppler alone. And if we do, that's a big risk when it goes wrong. Because we know what other podiatrists do rely on this. We had a very good talk from Joe Mills, who reminded us that 10% of all vascular experts, that can include your high risk foot podiatrists, your vascular podiatrists, and your vascular surgeons, um, have an error rate of about 10% when trying to detect PAD by pulse palpation alone. 10%, one in 10 gets missed. And if that's under reporting it and missing it, that's a real problem. Um, and also with Doppler, although we know in the right hands with the right skill set, it's a really reliable tool. Um, we do find in the UK, we, we're playing a lot of Doppler sounds to podiatrists and um, we're still struggling to identify monophasic against um, uh, biphasic. So if I, if I play you a sound now, for example, I'll just try this. So that waveform is a monophasic waveform. Yeah. Do you want to hold it up again? Hold it up again, Martin. I've got you on big yeah. screen now. Okay, hang on a minute. I love how you've just got this on your phone, Martin. This is great. Well, it won't be a second. Here we go. Oh, it's, uh, it's playing up. I'll, I'll bring it back in a minute, but the wow, okay. wow, wow sound is to a lot of podiatrists still a biphasic sound to them so they need to see it as well as hear it do you want that one more time i've got it okay yeah it's good. a really it's a really important distinction So it's all above the line. There's no reverse flow. It's an acceleration, deceleration. So you're hearing a wow, wow, rather than a da dum, 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 for example. So it's really important for actually get better at this. But the problem we've got at the moment is that a lot of people don't know that then they're um, uh, uh, hearing a monophasic pulse. So they can miss it on palpation. They can miss it on Doppler intonation. And then if they don't take pressures prior to, say, for example, a nail surgery, in somebody with hypertension who may be a smoker, then we could have a situation that there's significant PAD there that's been undetected prior to that podiatry intervention. So it might be a deep deprivement of a wound, it could be a nail surgery, it could be a steroid injection. But we can't afford to miss PAD. Bearing in mind, we've got it in at least one in five of our population over the age of 60. 
Yeah. The thing that I really, um, really, I, I've taken with me, you know, from four years ago was when, when Peter said in, in the last uh, episode you did for us that, 50, I think I think I remember this correctly, that 50% of uh, people with PAD are, are sort of uh, asymptomatic as well. Um, yeah. and I, I remember that shocking me at the time. And when I re-listened to it today on my run, I thought, oh, my goodness, like, um, given that how, how, how sort of prevalent it is and how, you know, you know, you just said, you know, people are asymptomatic, one in five have got it. Um, I'm just made of questions right now based on some loads of things you've said. And I'm just trying to think of a good order to put them in. But when it comes to PAD, can we talk to the the diagnostic tests? Um, you mentioned the um, the three P's. Could we speak a bit in a bit more detail just in case there are people listening that aren't familiar with what the three P's are yeah. and maybe even make reference to their, you know, their sensitivity, their specificity as well? Okay, Craig, can you bring up slide set two? Sure, hang on. Uh... Marvellous. So the three P's there is, is basically um, uh, taken from the existing research, including Peter's research, which he's done a lot of in the last decade or so, which I avidly follow. And it's the principle of, of doing all three. So your pulse palpation plus your phases, which is your Doppler intonation, plus your pressures. What everybody wants is the one test that does it all. Well, although there's some promising stuff coming through with um, uh, post-tibial uh, pulse duplex, now arterial duplex, and a couple of um, publications recently on that alone as an early diagnostic assessment, this combination of three we find pragmatically on the front line of day-to-day -day vascular diagnostics to be the best combination um, in, a, in a, a population presenting with not just one condition, but many conditions. So it's just the three things together, and then we'll add in Wi-Fi, which we'll talk about in a bit. But Peter, do you want to talk a bit about the, the relative sensitivity and specificity of the three tests? Mm. Um, pulse palpation is notoriously unreliable. And I think if you, if you get your colleague in and ask them to palpate the pulse, someone will find it, someone won't. You know, it's notorious. Um, it's very subjective. Doppler is our most accurate test. So it's got the highest levels of sensitivity compared to all the other non-invasive tests. And it's particularly useful in people with diabetes, um, which is interesting. And it's probably why it's one of my favourite tests. But it comes with um, all of those difficulties that Martin was talking about before. We have trouble identifying potentially what's pathological, just using our ears alone. Um, we've got a long way to go in getting better at interpreting the output of Doppler and technique is just so critical. So I had students in the clinic on Tuesday and it's amazing how they can make, you know, what should be a triphasic waveform just look so bad with horrible technique. Um, so, you know, angle is critical, anchoring your hand and all of those things um but yeah it's a really good test pressures um it depends on the pressure and the population so all of these tests really are dependent on what population you're doing them in it depends if they have diabetes if they're incredibly high risk or if you're in the community but essentially if you've got someone with diabetes um your toe brachial index is going to have superior sensitivity so it's going to be more likely to detect disease when it is there in people with diabetes. Um, but the specificity of the ankle brachial index tends to always be higher. So this is where people run into a bit of trouble because often they'll take an ABI and then if they don't get the result, they would potentially match the clinical picture. They'll say, oh, well, it's unreliable anyway. Um, it needs to be interpreted with caution. So if we've got an ABI value that is low, it is absolutely low. There is no doubt that that person has disease. So if we've got low ABIs. Um, the high specificity means that this person absolutely has disease. You could put your house on it. Um, it's when we get ABI values in a normal range that they start to become a little bit less accurate. So, and that's something that's hard to get your head around. You, you do a test and it's normal. It should be normal, but often if you just took that in isolation, it would carry very little value in my overall um, vascular assessment. And Peter, so can I, I just come in there? Can I just come in there? That that sort of thing about the normal ABPI, 
what we find because we use it all the time as well as toe pressures is that you, when you get the normal ish or the normal abpi but you get a monophasic pulse signal then you know things are a bit awry so for, for yeah. me clinically and i don't know if this ties in with what you said about com combination of the sensitivity and specificity but doppler plus pressures together be it doppler plus ankle pressure or doppler plus toe pressure really helps me to interpret the presence and severity of any uh, any disease that's falling outside of those normal ranges sometimes yeah absolutely i think it's building a clinical picture you want as much information as you can get um you know and i liken it to biomechanical assessment you're not going to just look at ankle joint range of motion and pin your whole diagnosis and plan on one test so i don't know why you know often people just take one like we'll look at the ankle break and then they call just do a doctor um and base everything on that one test it's um i think it's similar to the um pronation thing you know just stick a medial wedge under everything and it'll be okay <laughs> ian, ian will tell me that's not okay <laughs> but you're getting twitchy here martin as soon as you said it um <laughs> is it um Thinking... So the other thing with that is that although toe pressures is the new kid on the block and we really love toe pressures now because it helps with um, people who've got sort of extensive leg artery calcification to tease out presence and severity of PAD and chronic limb threatening ischemia, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, when we've got the vasospastic toes, which we get quite a lot of in Britain, um, in the older population, the toe pressure is not very reliable. But we know yeah. that things are okay usually because the pulse palpation and the Doppler signal tells us that things are pretty normal midfoot. We've got cold um, toes with a really sort of weedy sort of uh, trace on the on the toe pressure kit or no trace at all. And instead mm -hmm. of pan panicking and sending them off to vascular, you step back, you look at your clinical picture and your history and you think, yeah, that's probably a vasospastic issue that's going on there, not a large vessel ischemia. Mm, I'm thinking about, I've got a patient um, in the student clinic and she has um, a vasoneural disorder and I just love it because the students like freak out every time <laughs> because they'll do the assessment, they get these beautiful biphasic pulses with Doppler and then they get this really low toe pressure and they go, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And I just wait for them to tweak because they, you know, her fingers and her toes are freezing cold um, most of the time. But yeah. <laughs> one thing, one thing we're doing with Doppler as well, Peter and and, and Ian, um, is that um, we're collating a um, a database of usable audiovisual waveforms. So um, we, we're turning this into an MCQ, multiple choice questionnaire. And we've worked with the Royal College on this sort of little resource. It's going to turn into a live CPD resource for members soon, where you can literally play 10 or 20 or 30 clips. You can hear them and see them, and you can test yourself against what, what you think they are. So they're all real-world clips. Um, and that should be coming live soon. And there's been so much appetite for this. Whenever we do these Doppler clips on screen like this or in workshops, People love hearing them. They just want to get more confident about interpreting the, um, the pathological ones. And generally, podiatrists are okay with irregular ones, but they struggle with the mono bi or the mono multiphasic sort of threshold sometimes. And we're also working with nurses. We work with a lot of lower limb nurses in our area of Manchester, where we're trying to get the confidence and the capabilities in nursing uh, with doctor interpretation as well, because podiatrists are okay with it, but nurses generally, they're, they're a sort of layer behind on confidence uh, around interpreting they'll use the abpi or the tbpi to take a pressure but they, they won't always want to get too involved in the interpretation of waveform we're trying to do that with with our nurse colleagues as well now and build it into the joint working we do with them just just thinking through the numbers here just to re, just to repeat them for my own clarity if if one in every five people over 60 has pad and ship shout to me if i've got if i've misremembered and if, if nearly half of people with pad have no symptoms would any clinician a podiatrist who's who's watching this who perhaps mostly sees a demographic their, their, their whole their case list is essentially north of 60 years old um it would be very reasonable for them to be doing the three p's on on, on every patient and regardless of the barriers or, you know uh, sort of experience cost etc it, it feels like it would be prudent to do whatever they can to overcome those barriers in a time where people are 
buying all sorts of gizmos for their clinics, like class four laser and stuff. It feels like time, energy and money should probably be spent really nailing down on, on, on these PAD diagnostic tests. Is that is that reasonable? That's a really sort of fair summary. And I, I'd love to think that that's how podiatrists now will put value on this basic diagnostic kit. And we don't want to call it advanced kit. At the end of the day, this is blood pressures in toes or arms or ankles nothing more than that so it's basic kit that does the job really well uh, and reliably um, and yes with that demographic that you've talked about there being the average podiatry caseload in many practices nhs here or private um, it would be risky to continue as, as the population increases to get older with long-term conditions pad been in the mix there to not do it and also to think proactively about this if you pick up pad that's asymptomatic and mild three years before it becomes a qualification pad then the opportunity for the gps to get right onto the cardiovascular risk management with best medicines is turned around because this is arterial disease and it needs to be treated in the same way as angina you know claudication is angina of the leg essentially and that's how we describe it to our patients our GPs. And if we can get that diagnosis nailed early in the asymptomatic people more, then with the trajectory of their life health in relation to life and limb events um, is going to be turned around. Uh, we know this. You know, we, we don't prescribe medicines for the sake of medicines. We prescribe cardiovascular medicines to prevent associated heart attacks and strokes and amputations. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember Peter saying last time, you know, arguing that you don't have time could possibly be mitigated by saying, well, you know, you have your initial assessment and then often you'll see people offering a or book in for a biomechanical assessment if you think you have a biomechanical problem. Or perhaps clinics could be offering, like we say, a, a vascular assessment if you think you have any circulation issues or indeed if you're over 60, this is something we recommend. Uh, is, uh, you mentioned that four years ago, Peter. Is anyone yeah. doing that yet? Well, certainly that's what, when I had a private practice, that's one of the first things we did was separate. So a lot of um, patients in private practice here are referred for their annual diabetes assessment. Um, and you'll try and do that along with a treatment in 20, 30 minutes. And that is not possible. It's not possible to do a thorough neurological and vascular assessment, throw in some muscle testing and joint range of motion, as well as do a, you know, an entire um, treatment. So the first thing we did was say, changing that mindset of our patients that this is why the doctors referred to you, this is very valuable um, and you need to, we will do this first and you come back for your treatment. And they were really accepting of that. So I think once you explain the value of, and the importance and you put the time in and show them that you're putting the time in and being thorough, I think they really appreciate that. So it's just changing the mindset of the patient well that this is valuable and I think it just to pick up on what you were saying before I think it really does speak to safety in order to be a safe practitioner if you're dealing with this population you need to be able to take the time to do these assessments so we had a couple of near misses sort of early in our career and I think oh, my husband and I had a practice together for a long time so early in our career we had a couple of near misses so uh, like we had um, an elderly fellow come for nail surgery who was a fairly poor historian. So he neglected to tell us that he was a really heavy smoker. We'd done nail surgery and he took months to heal and it just took us so long to figure out why. And then all of a sudden, you know, one day he's talking about smoking and it, the light bulb went off and was like, oh my God, you know, how could we have not seen this and just put us in this whole spiral of, you know, we need to be as standard looking at people's vascular um, status before we're doing nail surgery. Like it's, it is, it's a minor procedure, but it is invasive and we cause a wound. So we need to be sure that that wound will heal. Peter, that's, that's really, no really, time, really no time important. Symptoms, you know, sorry, so, really important point there, Peter, because we we've had. I've, I'm I'm in, in the knowledge of a couple of cases that I've been asked to come and look at where we, we've we've had nitrous in the NHS in health clinics um, and private practice who've both had devastating outcomes from nail surgery and when you go back and look at part of the why it was inadequate vascular assessment relying on pulse palpation um, sometimes with or without Doppler 
and we've had cases of amputation in the UK, um, small numbers, but cases of amputation that have been attributed to more than anything that lack of vascular assessment in otherwise experienced podiatrists. This isn't new graduates, this is people with lots of experience who are having those near misses or occasionally having disasters and of course the patients have the disasters primarily. But the podiatrists, when you talk to them about this afterwards, they're devastated. It can be a career um, nightmare um, for many, many people and confidence and capabilities again for years afterwards. Um, so it's a really important thing that we get our heads around and we need to take away the fear of doing these tests, the fear of dealing with people with arterial disease, if we can get a little bit more savvy. And here's a positive photo. This is taken um, a couple of weeks ago at private practice, that's Mark, who asked me to come in and do some training for his staff. And you can see on his board there, he's a musculoskeletal uh, sort of podiatrist, a bit like you, Ian, maybe. Um, but he's now bought himself his new uh, vascular diagnostic kit and he has to come in to come in and do some training with him and his team and that's what we're seeing now in the uk both nhs and private practitioners are asking us to come in um, give them the, the sort of um, the abc of how to use this kit in practice rather than leaving it in the cupboards with the batteries running well um, and it is changing so there's a real momentum now i'd still say we've, we've got a long way to go but we've got that movement that momentum in podiatry um, that is, 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 is picking this up and there are a lot of teams around the UK now that are doing this and we've also probably now when I last spoke to you we probably had about three or four vascular podiatrists around the UK whose role is primarily vascular diagnostics and management and triage we've now got about 15 um, so it's still small numbers compared to the number of NHS organizations around the UK but it's growing and the high risk foot teams are also seeing that they need to dedicate part of their energy and their um, uh, commitment and their, uh, their, their their role to vascular diagnostics. We can't send all this to secondary care units all the time and particularly during COVID we realised we could only send people into hospital who really needed to go. So in a way COVID might have upped our game a bit in doing and triaging the vascular diagnostics of people in community clinics um, to decide whether they really needed to go into hospitals or not in those uh, terrible few months when um, Hospitals were virtually closed down to anyone apart from the urgent need. Yeah, this is great to hear. I mean, it's clear that it's clear there's the need, and it's just overcoming those barriers. Let can we? I know that our listeners last time, and I know with every episode, they love they love the things that feel applicable to them. So it, obviously, all of this, is, but they love the things that they can really kind of um, potentially apply. Mon the, the classic apply it Monday morning test. So we've talked about sort of the ability that the people need to do this, but they also then need to have the confidence to not just do the assessment, but to apply clinical reasoning, make a diagnosis, uh, know when to wait and when not to, you know, what, what's urgent, what isn't urgent. Um, is there a chance you could, you could talk us through a kind of example from practice of what that, that, that journey might look like, just to make people sort of realise that it's, it's, it's nothing to fear? Yeah, I mean, Craig, if you can bring up that second slide set again, I'll just use a couple of slides there. I've got a case example, Annie. Oh, perfect. And, perfect. and I've also got mm -hmm. just the numbers to look at first before we take Annie perfect. on. Um, so I'll just move on from that one. So that's three Ps. This is a, a Wi-Fi classification slide, which is a bit sort of hard to read there. But basically, if we break the numbers down, my formatting's jumped a bit with um, uh, transferring the PowerPoint over. But you can see there that we've got a green column an amber column and a red column. Oh, sorry. And if oh, you start God. to populate um, the, the, the three P's approach with data and numbers, so you've got palpable in green, your palpable triphasic, biphasic pulses, and good ankle pressures, 120 or more, presuming they are compressible, um, and the uh, toe pressure is greater than 95, you, you're probably good to go with most of your podiatry interventions in that patient, nail surgery, steroid injections, deep debridement of wound. In the amber list there, where the pulses are maybe not easily palpable, the Doppler phases are a bit whooshy, and then you've got numbers that might be anywhere between, uh, on the ankle, 50 and, and 100, or greater than 200 if you've got calcification, um, and with the toe pressures, anywhere between 30 and 90 millimetres of mercury, uh, 95 there. Then we've probably got a degree of PAD, where we want to be cautious and maybe managing that patient, depending on asymptomatic wound, non-wound, in different ways, but being aware of their arterial disease. And then the red column is your non-palpables, monophasic or absent on Doppler because the artery might be occluded. 
and then you've got like peter said earlier a low ankle pressure is always bad it's never good news a low ankle pressure or it's greater than 200 with a monophasic pulse set it could be stenosed and calcified and then you've got your toe pressures less than 30. so again if monophasic on doppler with toe pressures less than 30 non-palpable that's a sign of critical limb ischemia or severe limb ischemia so these are the sort of number ranges to think of when you put three p's together um, and start to look for those trends and then if we go through to a case which i think i've put in here which is um annie so this is annie an example case uh now annie's 68 i don't know if you can see that slide okay there she's got hypertension she's got diabetes reasonable control um not brilliant She's got known PAD in her right leg. She quit smoking last year. She's got arthritis. She's got chronic involuted left big toenail with recurrent infections. Feet are fairly warm, unreliable, but that we always sort of have a feel of those. Pulses are palpable in the left foot, we think. So we've got like a little plus there. The question mark means palpable. Uh, they're non-palpable in the right foot, but PT is query palpable in the left foot. Um, being referred to podiatry, um, needs nail surgery chronic involuted nails so what do we do next with annie we apply that three p's approach so we've had a feel already for pulses we're not really sure uh, we've got some non-palpables and a possible palpable so we add in the three p's um and if i can just move that forward um here we've got full data set so just give you a minutes to absorb it we've got pressures up on the brachial arteries and both brachial pulses are palpable at the wrist which is important because we pick up PAD in the upper limb. Uh, we've got good pressures up there, fairly similar. Um, we've checked femoral pulses. They're palpable and triphasic or biphasic, uh, the T or the B. Uh, down at the knee, we're monophasic on the right side at the, uh, behind the popliteal. We're monophasic down at the foot. But the limb of concern, which is the nail surgery limb, we're triphasic at the femoral, we're biphasic behind the knee and palpable, and we're biphasic down at the foot. And we don't rely on that alone. Remember, she's got diabetes. We're not quite sure always whether it's a good thing, this. We take some pressures. We find she's got ankle pressures of 135, 130 in that left limb. And we've got a, a toe pressure of 97. So if we work out the ABPI and the TBPI after that, we're ABPI of 0 0.9 in the left limb, the limb that we need to do nail surgery on, toe TBPI of 0 0.7, which are basically reasonably normal range. So uh, in this case, uh, we rang up the vascular team to discuss it with them because the podiatrist was a bit um, worried about the fact that she had PAD in the other limb. Reasonable thing to do. Uh, the surgeons asked about what was going on in the left limb. The podiatrist explained it. Uh, nail surgery was uh, advised. It was proceeded and healed well. So that was basically not having to send Annie in for any sort of further testing in the hospital and to proceed safely but cautiously with nail surgery in that left limb. Now, had she had um, an involuted nail in the right limb, we might have been a little bit more thoughtful about not doing nail surgery there um, be uh, uh, before we think about maybe some revascularization, depending on severity of the nail problem, whether it could be managed conservatively, or whether we really need to go for nail surgery, but consider revascularization first. She's not critically ischemic in the right limb, but she would certainly heal slowly. She might be similar to what Peter described earlier as near miss patient for the right limb. So that's an example in, in case of, of, of how we might use this information to make a safe but proactive decision on, on somebody presenting for nail surgery. That's perfect. Just looking at the logos on the left, I look the three P's and the Wi-Fi logo. Could you just remind us, um, we talked a lot about three P's, could you just remind us um, regarding Wi-Fi, please? Yeah, I'll just jump you back a little bit. Um, Wi-Fi is um, this sort of classification system at the top there, so the three circles. Uh, where you're looking at the three domains together that are most likely to predict an amputation in, uh, in many, many people with or without diabetes, but primarily it's been researched in the diabetes population. When you put the three domains together, severity of wound, severity of ischemia, so W for wound, I for ischemia, and FI, Wi-Fi, foot infection. So you've got wound, ischemia, and foot infection, and you've got 0 to 3 on each scoring um, domain for each one so not being no problem and three being uh, terrible um, and uh, you know one and two in between so you would score your patients in those three domains um, and the numbers underneath although they jumped a bit there you start to see your ranges for toe pressures uh, tbpi ankle 
uh, pressures, ABPI and Doppler and pulses. So you can, even without um, having your toe pressure kit um, or your, uh, your your ABPI, you can still use the principles of Wi-Fi to determine what the other two domains are. How severe is the wound? How deep and tracking is it? How severe is infection? And then look at whether you've got palpable monophasic pulses or non-palpable monophasic pulses or easily palpable multiphasic pulses. So you'd be guessing at you know, a Wi-Fi that would score out there. So although initially complicated, Ian, it's a really useful tool that the Vascular Society in the UK is adopting um, uh, largely now in its new uh, sort of guidelines um, to be used as po possibly a universal limb risk triage tool. So if we in podiatry are using it to communicate across the vascular teams about the, the severity of any presenting PAD or chronic limb threatening ischemia or critical ischemia that's three terms there but um we can tell you more about that if you want but basically you can determine severity and immediate or, or medium term limb risk for amputation or survival of limb and and um and, and lack of risk for amputation uh, and also the the need for vascularization ties in to using these three domains as well perfect and while we are clarifying terminology slash abbreviations and i'll do this for my for myself as much as anyone else is thing we've mentioned a few times cli and clti um and again i speak on behalf of myself and i'm sure many others do you mind just clarifying for us what those mean and um i mean is, is it new pad terminology i mean what does it mean why is it important okay thanks for that i mean peter you probably want to have a, a, a go at this one i'm guessing um sure <laughs> So PLI is the traditional term. So um, it's what we've been using for a very long time and just standing for critical limb ischemia, but it had very strict criteria as to what was considered critical. Um, so I think it was off the top of my head, ischemic rest pain, um, pressures less than 50 and an active ulceration or tissue loss. But what uh, I guess clinicians found was that there was a broader spectrum of disease that was limb threatening that potentially didn't meet this strict criteria of CLI. So what happened was they essentially broadened the criteria, called it critical limb threatening ischemia. Um, and there's a really nice uh, paper written by Michelle Miskell, I think, Martin, is that right? In yeah, I think, your... I think it's... Craig, can you bring up slide set one again? In your college um, magazine a few months back, or it might even have been last year now, um, where they talk about this very thing. Um, yeah, yeah, this one here in the middle. Um, so Michelle Miskell, uh, Michelle Thurman co-wrote this during COVID, didn't they, about cases who were dealing with, uh, and that, I mean, we, we use the term chronic limb threatening ischemia rather than critical limb threatening chronic, ischemia. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. But yeah, and, and even the surgeons tend to mix it up because the CLTI is the new terminology that's coming in. And like Peter says, it's a broader spectrum of PAD with a wound usually and with infection or possibly infection. Whereas the CLI, the critical ischemia, is purely the severe PAD um, with or without rest pain and, and necrosis. But you can have moderate severity PAD. Um, that's got no wound and that's not a chronic wound threatening ischemia. If the person with moderate severity PAD then develops a wound, their limb has got a degree of threat. So then it's chronic limb threatening ischemia. So and anyone with P any level of PAD plus a wound is my sort of simple uh, terminology now is CLTI. And we're moving over, I think in the UK, and I, I think you are too, Peter, aren't you, with this term, to bring it into our journals like Michelle Miskell and Michelle Thurman have done here to be the new terminology to start to use with our vascular teams to clarify we've got a complex triad of issues going on here ischemia and wound with or without severe or mild infection for example. Perfect and um, I'm just looking at the clock there's 50 minutes that have gone already I've still got so much I want to Oh do my goodness. Stuff. Yeah, um, and actually Ian we've had a lot of questions we had a lot of questions as well and I just have to apologize to those people that the a lot of the questions were out of the flow, but is hopefully there, is there, is there Peter anything you want to bring up or can I ask one more? I, I reckon on my list in front of me, I've got one more. Perhaps. Yeah. So can okay, I well, I hopefully Martin and Peter can come along and answer some of these questions on Facebook later on. Um, we could probably go for another hour just answering the questions that have been asked. <laughs> yeah.
um well let me finish off with this one then um because it's always it's always interesting me obviously we talked about uh, you know toe t- you know assessing at toes assessing at foot and when when people palpate pulses it's often you know the foot the, the pedal pulses and i know every now and then someone will will get a bit a bit uh, a bit trendy or a bit excitable and they'll go up to the popliteal pulse can we talk about the femoral um the femoral pulses like are are, are we doing it as podiatrists Sh- should we be doing it and if so when and how um uh, well, I'll, I'll give you my sort of day-to-day explanation because we do them every day now. Um, I didn't come in podi- to podiatry doing femoral pulses. I hadn't been trained. I didn't feel confident. I didn't want to go fishing around in people's groins. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a high-risk lower limb podiatrist uh, with wound care uh, for 10 years, I avoided them um, still, uh, stupidly at the time, but um, that was where we were. As a vascular podiatrist, it's a must-do. And I would strongly appeal to you in that in the MSK community, we need to get all the MSK podiatrists comfortable with the idea of the 30 second femoral pulse check, where when you've got symptoms around um, thigh, buttock, um, hip area, of course, it may be MSK related, but to avoid being in that silo of your condition, um, I get a lot of people in my clinics with suspected PAD who've also got MSK problems. And I need to check the femoral pulses when I've got thigh, buttock, or um, hip pain because it can often be uh, a blocked iliac artery, um, either bilateral um, uh, infrequently or more commonly on one side. So I don't dive in for everybody, but if I've got symptoms that are claudication-like, but they're in the thigh and the buttock, um, or they may be lumbar canal stenosis-like, but I've got some evidence of PAD distally, so I've got monophasic foot pulses, Poor, poor palpation there. I've not even got a Doppler maybe on me today. Palpation. I then pop, palpate behind the knee and, and popliteal pulses are not easy to feel, but they're much easier to listen to. Um, if I'm monophasic behind the knee or non-palpable behind the knee, and I've got thigh symptoms, then I want to go up to the femoral pulse and just check that it's easily palpable, which it should be. If I've got somebody with obesity and lower back problems and heart, uh, cardiovascular risks together, I want to go into that femoral pulse to check that we have got um, a reasonably multifaceted pulse. So although I can't always feel it in people with obesity, getting my Doppler on there and having a quick listen will tell me quite um, in 10 seconds whether it's multiphasic or monophasic. And that will give me an idea about whether I've got fairly proximal um, uh, arterial disease. So if I've got those thigh problems, I want to do it. And if I've got a distal PAD and I want to track up the limb to see how far up the limb it's going, that might turn around my decision about whether I refer that person to the hospital team for intervention or not. And more recently, we've had papers that have said that even if you've got iliac stenosis, as well as FEMPOF, which is the common stenosis, that exercise therapy um, is often the right first go-to therapy rather than invasive intervention. So where I used to refer all my um, iliac stenoses off to the vascular team, I'll now probably only send the ones that are really severe um, we'll start, first of all, with exercise therapy and GP-managed cardiovascular care um, if we diagnose proximal PAD um, as well as distal. But that's my little pitch on it. But, hey, Peter, where, where, where are you in Australia with this at the moment? Femoral pulse checks. We've got our first few students doing it, by the way, in at least one UK university now, Salford. Well done. Nice. <laughs> well done. Um, no, like we've got a long way to go there. Uh, to be honest, so that's not something we routinely do here. Um, why not? Why, 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 why is it when, when we learn all about the theory of the femoral triangle in our first year at university? But why don't we, that at that point, put it into practice with, with femoral pulse palpation? Is it about well, the we're not afraid to, you know, we're not afraid to put the measuring tape on the ASIS and the umbilicus to look at limb length. So I don't see how it's different. Um, yeah, so no, we've got a long way to go there. And again, different. I'm here today. I deal with a different population, that's predominantly very distal disease. But um, yeah, no, we've got a long way to go there. Could, could I tease with the idea that maybe a lot of the podiatry lecturers that are influ- influential in this, in in how they teach first year and above, are maybe ex MSK interested podiatrists and I just haven't thought that femoral pulse checks is is their domain and. We, do we need to get to the lecturers of the first years before we get to everybody else um, to really change their game? And we've done this in Salford. There was a reluctance in Salford to take femoral pulse palpation on in first year. This year, they've done it for the first time, and I think it's gone all right. But 
I literally had to lie on a table and have the lecturers that taught me 30 years ago feel my femoral pulse to get them over the hump of them maybe not wanting to do it. And then we move on from that. But femoral pulse checks, it's a must do in my mind for the podiatrists of the future. And it's so quick and easy. Well, Craig, I, I, I didn't think we were gonna have to do it, but we're gonna have to ask Martin and Peter back for a, for a third part. Or something. <laughs> I, I can't promise we'll still be going in another 85 episodes time. So you, you may have yeah. to come back sooner. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're just not gonna have time to, you know, we're at the hour already, so. No, look, I, I apologize to all those who have asked questions. Uh, there's, there's lots there. Hopefully Martin and Peter can come back and answer them lately. Uh, later, we've had um, double our usual numbers watching this as, as our live, so that shows you just how popular the topic is. For those of you who have come late, if you check back Facebook in about 10, 15 minutes, they'll render it and you can watch it again. I'll do my best to get it up on YouTube later today. I'm feeling a little unwell today, so I might not get to it today. So look, so thanks, Martin. Thanks, Peter. Um, you know, One last signpost there, Craig. We, we've got the Facebook um, Peripheral Arterial Disease Clinicians Support Network. It's a mouthful. But it's on Facebook. It's a it's a closed group, and all those questions can be going into there, and we will answer okay. them. Do you want to paste the Do you want to paste the link to the group in the thread? Um, I'm not clever enough to do that right now, but I'll have to. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. I'll do anyway. it. I'll sort it. Okay. So look, thanks very much, guys, and we'll end it there. Thanks so much, guys.